Before we talk about Impact Wrestling, a reminder, four down, 11 to go. Buy the Assume Jeff Jarrett position shirt from the OTRS Central Store at Pro Wrestling Tees. If I sell 15 of these by the end of September, I have to buy the old four-disc TNA Best of Jeff Jarrett King of Mountain fucking DVD set. Watch all four discs at 16 fucking hours and then come on here and review that DVD set for you. And you know deep down that you live for me to rant about the founder, the Memphis Midcard piece of crap. Well, here's a chance to put your money where your mouth is, babies. 11 more to go. And hell, I'll even donate all the proceeds from any shirts that are sold this month uh, to hurricane relief efforts, whether it be in Texas or Florida, uh, one of the Caribbean islands, wherever the case might be. And I'll match it out of pocket with donations myself. So feel free to buy more than 11 of these shirts. Let's make something good happen. And then you sadistic, sadistic people will get something else good out of it that will torture me. Buy a shirt. That's all I'm saying. Let's talk about Impact Wrestling this week, though. We start off with the X Division tag match, which is fine because it follows up to what happened at Destination X with Caleb Conley getting involved, with Petey Williams getting involved. I'm fine with seeing Petey Williams hit the Canadian Destroyer. It's cool to start off, I guess, with an opening match. With that said, where's the story going forward with the X Division champion? Um, maybe the next guy to get an X Division title shot is going to be Desmond Xavier. It was nice to see that they actually remembered that he's still on the roster because I don't remember seeing him uh, over the past two weeks after he won the Super X Cup. You know, guy has a big victory like that. It should be something to propel the character to another level. You would think you would want to follow up on that. But, of course, we're talking about follow-up when we're talking about this company, and regardless of what they're called, they do a lot of the same crap that they've done for years, which is not good. Here's a novel concept. LAX has a tag match. Um, It's just good. I'm okay with your champions not wrestling all the time. WWE has their champions wrestle far too often. It diminishes the importance of the championship, the champions, and when they actually have to defend those titles because they defend them too much and they just, in general, wrestle too much. But on the flip side, you could also have your guys not wrestle enough, and that's kind of a problem to me with LAX. I think, well, who, who would, who's technically the tag champions? Is it Ortiz and Santana? And the point I'm getting at, yes, I could look it up on the website. Yes, I could pay a little more attention. But the point is, because of the way the group is presented, it's really hard to differentiate who the actual tag champions are. And it just shouldn't be like that. These guys have had the straps for a little while now. I should know more about them, and I should have more facial and name recognition of them. Afterwards, OVE comes out. Makes sense to me. They've been on the show the past few weeks. They've beaten everybody they've faced so far. Now they want to go up against LAX. They want the tag straps. And oh my God, a tag title match. What a novel concept. Until you realize how stupid it is that OVE would have to go wrestle at another promotion crash in Tijuana, Mexico in order to get that title shot. And I'm sure this is going to be shown on Impact next week. I'm sure it is. But again, why are we building to a title match that's ultimately going to be in another promotion? Why does this company continue to want to put over other promotions? The whole premise of GFW, Global Farce Wrestling, seems to be wanting to put over other companies and being just glad that you have the honor of being associated with them. It's ridiculous. This match should be something you should be building up to that's in the impact zone next week. Not in a freaking good other promotion in Tijuana, Mexico. Unbelievable. Uh, the knockouts tag match. You had a little bit of story and purpose for this match happening, and that's fine. Although the match seemed very rushed and very short. Uh, knockouts have for years been a part of a company in a positive way. Had some of the higher rated segments. Uh, been some of the most over performers. They deserve more time and better stuff. They deserve more segments. That's just the way it is. Especially with some of the knockouts you have in the fold now, some of the knockouts you're bringing in, uh, we could do better. We could do better. Now, with all the stuff that we know allegedly happened with Rosemary at Triple Mania, after the heel team wins and they start beating down the baby faces, I'm sitting there and I'm like, 
Rosemary comes out, man, this was kind of like a mini feel good moment. Even though I found it odd that she wasn't selling anything wrong with her arm at all. You know, the crowd understood kind of what had happened at Triple Mania and they popped a little bit to see Rosemary. And it's like, I miss when these type of returns, these surprises, uh, these baby faces coming out to make the heroic rescue were done properly like this. I'm like, man, here's a chance to give Rosemary some nice shine, reestablish her a little bit. This is cool. And I thought we were going down a good path until all of a sudden we had the Tara Valkyrie debut. Whatever the hell her name is. With all the goodwill and buzz you were getting out of Rosemary's return, why would you immediately undercut that with Valkyrie debuting at the same time and then taking out Rosemary? I have no problem with the premise of these two knockouts having a feud. I have no problem with the premise of having Valkyrie do this to Rosemary. It just seems like you tried to cram all this crap into one segment on one show when you would have been better spreading it out over two segments, over two shows. In my opinion, the Rosemary return and heroic save should have been the end of this segment. And then next week, you could do a similar type of thing. And that's when Tara Valkyrie comes out and she takes out Rosemary. Why immediately undercut the good feelings that come along with Rosemary coming back? I'm just saying, I thought it was unnecessary. Um, what else was unnecessary was Conan's line about whether or not there was some white privilege going on with Johnny Impact uh, wanting a title shot and him thinking Jim Cornette was going to give it to him. You know, never mind the fact that the guy, I don't think he just from a storyline kayfabe standpoint within GFW, never mind the fact that when ADR, who is Mexican, had the title, he was ultimately stripped of the title where the preeminent storyline on the programming for weeks was revolving around ADR and whether or not he was going to be a part of LEX. To which ultimately, of course, there's no real payoff to anything because of how things ultimately played out. The ADR guy who was Mexican that won the world title from a long-reigning dominant champion named Bobby Lashley, who happens to be a black gentleman, Freaking battle toad, black man. Just saying. Uh, the whole concept of a Johnny Impact, who has three titles from AAA coming in, people knowing him from WWE and Lucha Underground and all these other places, wanting a title shot. The white privilege line was dumb. It's a typical type of shit we see out of Conan to me at this stage of his fucking career, going with the cheap shit, trying to sit there and do this and do that. If you want to say that about WWE, say it all fucking day long. Because it is 100% applicable and appropriate. But this is the same company, from again, a storyline kayfabe standpoint, where they gave people the opportunity, black, Hispanic, Mexican, Japanese, white, whatever, to get into the 20-man gauntlet for the gold, where Loki got number fucking 20, in the draw, he was the last guy and didn't even make it to the final two, whereas Eli Drake and Eddie Edwards, the two white boys, started off one and two and they made it all the way to the end and Eli Drake, who entered number two, ends up winning the whole damn thing. I mean, just from a storyline kayfabe standpoint, what fucking sense in the world does this make? A company that actually pushes black and Hispanic and Asian wrestlers like they matter treats them seriously, doesn't always put stereotypical type of gimmicks, whereas all the while it's Conan with this fucking stupid-ass LAX shit that advances certain types of stereotypes about Mexicans, Hispanics, Latin, Latinos, whatever the fuck. You get the goddamn point. It's not about white privilege here. It's about sitting there and feeding into the fucking stereotypes. So the whole white privilege line was fucking stupid. I want to make sure I called that out. And the whole premise to me of Johnny Impact wanting a title shot is understandable. The whole premise of Loki being pissed off about that and talking about spots on the line was fine. Actually thought for once Loki was decent on the mic because he had like that stupid insane intensity to him and I thought it worked. And if it leads to a short term Johnny Impact Loki angle, fine. That works. This is crazy because you know ultimately Loki ain't there much longer. So, it's just weird. Uh, speaking of weird, why is anybody supposed to like Grado? 
Now he finds out that Laurel Van Ness is Canadian, therefore not American. Therefore, we now realize how the whole thing actually freaking works with him marrying somebody to get a visa. And he just calls off the wedding instantly. Like, what is likable about this guy? What is funny about this story at this point? Everything about this is dumb and stupid and shame on GFW for putting out this storyline and making Laurel Van Ness look so stupid and for trying to pound this down our throat that Grado is somebody you're supposed to get behind, make any type of sympathetic figure whatsoever. Again, if this storyline ultimately results in the only applicable, appropriate payoff that there is, which is Grado marrying Joseph Park, which would be the most sensible and easiest fucking thing to do right now, and also would carry some potential benefit for you from a short-term exposure standpoint for your television show that, by God, we all know freaking needs it, then let's hurry up and get to the point ta -ta today, Junior. But we ultimately know they probably aren't. Anyways, moving on. Uh, one thing you will notice, and I talked earlier about the premise of GFW and what they do, they really go out of their way to put over other promotions. And I get you've got AAA, they've got their Triple Mania 25 show. It's a big deal. You know, I don't have a problem with you mentioning some of the guys that are on the show. But man, they devoted a lot of time to video packages and interviews this week. Great that there was an American Top Team, but that was a lot of time devoted to the show. Maybe it works for this one week because honestly, one of the things this company does well is those interviews and giving them a real kind of organic feel to them. Uh, you know, showing Eddie Edwards winning the GHC championship for Pro Wrestling Noah again is an indication of almost like you're putting over another company. But then we got to the whole thing of what happened with Rosemary and the reaction backstage, especially from drunk stone Jeff Jarrett. The way this whole thing was packaged and presented, I mean, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of people talked about, oh, if GFW is going to turn this into a storyline, then shame on them. The way it was almost kind of presented, the cameras just happened to be there, they happened to be rolling, they happened to catch all the action, the way they're kind of coming at each other, but they're coming at each other in a kayfabe fake way. Talking about, I think it was LaParka and Jeff Jarrett, but they're not coming at him in a real way. Um, this whole thing, to me, now indicates that this whole fucking thing was a storyline. So GFW wasn't turning it into a storyline. It was a fucking storyline. And I'll continue to believe that, especially when I saw Rosemary, knowing how quickly these tapings were taped after Triple Mania, and the fact that Rosemary seemed 100% fine after everybody had such a big conniption fit about it. You believe what you want, but believing this is real was bullshit to me, I'm just saying. Uh, we ended this show with the Global Championship match, Matt Seidel doing something sensible. Why would I want a next division title shot? I want a global title shot. Eli Drake. Eli Drake. A man you can be proud of as world champion. Now, you could give me a little bit more of Moose and a little bit more of EC3 on this goddamn show, but at least Eli Drake is a champion that I can be proud of and I can get behind. I don't know if we always need to have him beating these fucking X Division guys using cheating tactics, but for now, whatever, I'll just bask in the glory of the fact that he main evented. This match was kind of a big deal for them. There was storyline reason for it to happen. And the right guy won. Yay! I didn't have much of a problem with this week's show, even though, honestly, I was kind of paying attention on the two TVs, some to the Patriots Chiefs game and some to this show, but it did enough to keep me engaged at times. Um, but we'll see how they go going forward. Now, for those of you that want to know about my thoughts on the founder taking a leave from GFW, you want to know about my thoughts on Anthem reportedly wanting out. I'm probably going to do separate videos on those. In fact, I know I will. So make sure you stay tuned for those. Because ultimately, remember, OTR Essential is not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. And those videos may be an indication of something you might not want, but you very well might need.